this evening in 1 Timothy, we're into verse 3, 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 3. But before we begin our Bible study this evening, we're going to allow a few moments of silent time where you can pray and represent yourself before the throne of grace. It's a time to use the rebound technique if needed. First John 1 John 1.9 says, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. So let's bow our heads together for a few moments and I'll finish this out in group prayer. Our Father God in heaven, we're delighted to have our freedom and be able to come together as Christians without persecution. Father, we pray you go forward with us in your word this evening, make it a source of encouragement and also challenge. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Okay, I want to read what we have so far, and then we'll read our new verse as we start a new section here. Verses 3 through 7, start a new section. I want to read uh, verse 1, 2, and 3. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the commandment of God our Savior, even the Lord Jesus Christ, our hope, to Timothy, a true student or son, in doctrine, as I urged you when I went into Macedonia, to remain in Ephesus that you may charge some that they teach no other doctrine. That's our new verse for the evening. We're going to take and I'm going to give you a little outline here and then we're going to exegete that baby. So verses 3 through 7, the purpose of the pastor teacher. We should recognize this is not a detailed study of the pastor teacher at this point. These are special selected things to cause Timothy to refocus. Refocus on his purpose. Fill in some gaps where he has failed to apply what he has learned from Paul. We're going to cover some of those small areas where Timothy really needs a tune-up. Now on to the exegesis of verse 3. In verse 3, the very first word we have in the English is as. It's an adverb used as a casual conjunction. Pathos. It's better translated since. I besought. And this is from the King James Version. I besought. It's the aorist active indicative of parakaleo. Which means here to command. It means a command given in a nice way. The aorist tense is a constantive aorist. It refers to a momentary action in which Paul commands Timothy to remain at Ephesus. The active voice, Paul produces the action of the verb as an apostle and Timothy's commanding officer. The indicative mood is declarative and in indicating the reality of Paul ordering Timothy to remain at Ephesus in spite of the fact that up to this point he has failed. In other words, failure is no reason to run. Principle, you don't run away because you fail. Get knocked down 40 times, 49 times, get up 50. That's the attitude. And um, Paul is not concerned that he has failed in the past. He has confidence that his, his training and his tune-up that he spent in time with Paul personally has got him squared away and that he is ready to perform. The next word, the should be you, it's the accusative singular direct object of the personal pronoun su. To abide still is the aorist active infinitive of prosmeno, uh, prosmeno, 
which means stay where you are. When I went is the present mental participle of haruomai. The participle is a temporal participle and it should be translated while I went into Macedonia. That is the conjunction hina introducing a final clause, purpose, aim, or goal. Thou mightest charge is the aorist active subjunctive of paragaleo, which means to instruct by direct command. The aorist tense is a constantive aorist. It gathers into one entirety the action of the verb. It takes the ministry of Timothy and gathers it into one entirety, regardless of its duration. And Timothy has to crack heads. He has to get tough. He has to use his authority. The active voice, Timothy, produces the action of the verb by commanding, instructing, directing pastors in Ephesus not to teach false doctrine. The subjunctive mood is used to state the objective as potential. Now, uh, I want to contrast when Paul first started out. He said, I, I'm commanding you, but it was asking him nicely. Timothy, if you'll do this for me. That's the word that he started out with. But he says to Timothy, you are going to have to paragaleo. You are going to have to be firm. You're go you may even have to Make an example out of somebody. And uh, I'll never forget when I started listening to tapes from the colonel. And what would happen was is Billy Graham would come through town on a crusade. And Billy Graham would evangelize all of these people. And what would happen is he'd, they'd bring them all down to the front. And they'd say, here is a list of churches. And you need to find one of them that that you can sit down and you can learn at. And well, Baraka was on the list when, when Billy Graham came through Houston and thousands of people got saved. Well, guess what? All of a sudden, you've got all these new attendees pouring into the building. And the colonel, this guy, he, he, would, he would literally, he would make an example out of somebody and I would blush listening to the tape young man why are you here why are you looking at that girl that's rude I'm teaching I'm speaking if you can't concentrate on what I'm saying pick out a spot on the wall and stare at it until it's time to leave and I'll see you in the hallway after class that's right you know and then if they were really young, he'd say, who is your, what's your dad's name? And he'd make them say their parents' name. I'll be talking to them. And this is during church. And I'm sitting there, I'm blushing, listening to the tape. He had me sitting up straight in the, in the kitchen. But that's what, that's what Paul is saying to Timothy. The first person that gets out of line, you are going to have to make an example out of them and you're going to have to exercise your authority so you don't get steamrolled. See, don't let the slightest uh, breach of protocol exist. Stop and address it. And I had to learn that lesson. And you find out that most of the people that are distracting others during class are there for the wrong reason and they needed you needed to stop and point out the breach so that they would leave and never come back see they were there for the wrong reason anyway why waste their time and i'm sure when the colonel lit up that guy in the pew there were 40 that left but they they were there just to look at the girls and that was that was uh their fault for being there for the wrong reason if you didn't know it he had uh, he had 
the woman that ran a modeling agency there in Houston, the first course that they had to take as signing up in, in her agency was to go down to Baraka Church and learn the doctrine of inner beauty. So the colonel would, he would teach that class. Well, the young men figured out that the whole church was full of models. And what did they want to do? Come in and gawk at the girls. And man, if you listen to any of those tapes, oh, it was, he was brutal now. So when I saw that word, I said, I know a guy who knows how to do that. Um, and maybe I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a Timothy compared to what the colonel was, but he was used to teaching uh, uh, military guys too. And so they were a lot more strict than what you and I have experienced. Some is the next word. It's the dative plural of disadvantage. From the indefinite pronoun tis. It refers to those under the influence of evil. Those in reversionism. Those who are legalistic. All of those who are troublemakers. And those who are positive towards doctrine. But still babies or adolescents. That means they're troublemakers. They're called certain ones. And so they don't. While, while they... The train has left the station and maybe they're headed in the right direction. They still got all these baggage and don't know how to function in a local church. And so he's saying, look, you're going to deal with a lot of problems. Nip it in the bud. You're going to have to take care of these certain people who are being distracting to others. And we have policy in our local church that anybody, anybody, anybody is welcome in our Bible classes. Anybody can come in and sit down and learn free of charge. We don't want your money. We want you to sit down and listen and see if you can understand the message, see if you're getting anything. Uh, we want you to, to grow as long as you are not a distraction to others. And that means that you, you can't, no unnecessary movement, no talking, anything that would be distraction during Bible class. And so all of you know how to, to follow protocol in Bible class. But these, these baby believers, these reversionists, they were, they were always causing trouble. And you know what they would do? They'd come in and whisper, well, that's not how Pastor so-and-so teaches it. Right in the middle of Bible class. And so Timothy was to say, stop now. I am speaking, it's rude to interrupt someone when they're speaking. This is the South where we have good manners and thoughtful for, thoughtfulness for others. Now, what are you doing speaking while I'm speaking? Do you want to get up here? See, he would have to stop and, and that's how you handle it. And the colonel knew how to do it. I'm not that great at it, but I had a great teacher. Certain ones. And then there's always the ones who uh, you get a visitor and you really need to let them have their freedom and not interrogate them too much because you don't want to breach their privacy. And, and you might be able to, some churches take this too far. I went to a, a Bible conference where nobody would talk to you. And I drove out of state to go to this thing. And it was like when class was over, Bam, they hit the door, and you, I, I didn't meet anybody while I was there. Like, well, I don't know anybody's name. And then I drove back home. So I, don't, I didn't really like that. But also, you don't need to take it too far, because then you might have somebody in from a background which they don't want you to know about. They may be having problems you don't, they don't want you to know about. So you're better off shaking their hand and say, my name is... X, and I'm glad to meet you. Thanks for coming. And if they offer you information, that's fine. But if they don't, let them have their privacy and their freedom to speak if they want to, and don't interrogate them too much because you may just run them off. See, they've got the privacy of their priesthood, and they should be able to come in and listen and not have to give us any information uh, as far as is concerned. If they look suspicious, 
they may get a few more questions along the way from some of our uh, persons in authority because we def uh, we uncovered a a uh, person that, and they offered the information we really didn't have to do uh, anything other than some research but we found someone who had been uh, convicted of some former um, crimes which could have been very dangerous to some of your young people who were in the congregation. And so, um, anyway, our guys know who to interrogate, and don't you worry about doing it. We'll let one of these guys who are, understand how to read people to do that type of thing. Certain ones, troublemakers. And so what we don't want to do is be a troublemaker. We don't want to be distracting. We don't want to knock anybody out of Bible class who wants to be here. We want to make sure they feel comfortable and that um, the local assembly functions as it should. That they teach no other doctrine is the Next phrase, it's all one verb, the negative plus the present active infinitive of heterodidaskale. And didasko means to teach. Etero means, uh, hetero means other of different kind of doctrine. When put together, it means not to teach heretical doctrine. The descriptive Present tense denotes the teaching of false doctrine in the process of occurrence. The active voice, evil and reversionistic people are producing the action of the verb by teaching something wrong. The infinitive of intended result fulfills a deliberate objective to stop false teaching in the Ephesian church. And I, just as a side note here, you should recognize when uh, if you read Paul's letters, he talks about the super apostles who would come in behind him and then they would say, yeah, Paul teaches that, but you also need to add this. And then we're going to have a section on the purpose of the law. They would always bring in some of the Ten Commandments and say, you need to honor the Sabbath. Look right here. It says honor the Sabbath and keep it holy. So that means you don't need to work. You know, on Friday at sundown to Saturday at sundown, you're going to keep the Sabbath. And they would, you know, you need to tithe. And uh, you need to, so they would come in behind Paul and they would add some teaching. And then they would point it out from the Old Testament. And believers bought it hook, line, and sinker. And so I, I, he, what happened was, is he, Paul recognized they were just moving in behind him. He would go to a place, they would wait till he moved out. They would move in right behind him and add to his teaching. And so here's what he did. Paul knew he was going on over to Macedonia over here and he left Timothy. He said, these guys are going to be moving in behind me. This is their, their forte. They come in behind me and they add to my teaching and they bring in the Mosaic law. I'm leaving you behind and I'm not, you just kind of hide over here and wait for them to show up, and then bring the axe. When they show up, bring in their heresies, you stand up and call them out. All right? We're going to lay the trap. We're going to chop the head off a snake. So we have the translation. Since I ordered you to remain behind at Ephesus while I went to Macedonia, in order that you might exercise command over certain ones not to teach heretical doctrine. And so we're going to go on and see. <clears throat> He's going to give the purpose of the pastor teacher all the way through verse 7. But down in a few more verses, he's going to explain the purpose of the Mosaic law, which... Uh, some of the false teachers were trying to bring in. We're also going to look at the doctrine of dispensations and we're going to see that the rules for living in each dispensation 
are different. And you had the age of the Gentiles and the inherent law. It was a spoken law given from fathers to sons. And it differed slightly from the Mosaic law, which was 613 commands given to Israel. And uh, it was the rules for living in the, uh, in the age of Israel. And then you have Jesus teaching about millennial law uh, there in the dispensation of the hypostatic union is called kingdom law and it differs slightly from that of the church age and then you come along and then you have the New Testament canon, the mystery doctrine that's the rules for living in the church age and so you have different rules for living in each dispensation and these false teachers were trying to bring in the teaching from the Mosaic Law and incorporate it into the mystery doctrine. You can't do that. And while nine out of the Ten Commandments are reiterated, see, in the mystery doctrine, nine out of ten of them. So there's continuity, but there's change. You know which one wasn't? Nine out of ten were reinstated in the mystery doctrine. The only one they left behind was remember the Sabbath and keep it holy. You can work seven days a week in the church age. Thank God for that. Okay. There's your better translation. Now. We're going to bring in a new doctrine. And this is going to be. It's going to help us. He says that they teach no other doctrine. No heretical doctrine. Teaching. Didasco. The doctrine of Gap. Gap is an acrostic. We're going to explain that. This is going to help us on uh, Sunday morning too as we're studying reversionism because it's going to give you a little more explanation of some of the uh, words that we're using there. You have the new PowerPoint. Doctrine of Gap. Point number one, the Gap Acrostic. Grace. That's the G. That means we didn't earn it or deserve it. We just looked at the doctrine of grace. The Bible says, as you receive Jesus Christ, so continue to walk in Him. So the idea is, is that we're saved by grace. And we continue to function in grace even after salvation. God uses the same plan. Apparatus is the second word. That's the A in the acrostic. That means there is a spiritual mechanic involved or a system. We're going to see how truth flows through the soul. Perception, that's the P in the acrostic, means to understand, to know, or to be cognizant of doctrine. So gap is the learning mechanism. It's the way that we take doctrine into the soul. This is a system of grace. Inculcation. Inculcation means that it's repeated over and over. Therefore we must first of all recognize a fact. No two of us have the same amount of perspicacity. Humanly speaking. That means that our intellectual IQs differ. 
However, spiritual IQ is the human spirit plus the amount of Bible doctrine stored in the human spirit and in the right lobe. It's stored under the noun uh, in the Hebrew, kokma, and the Greek word, epinosis. The distinction between the human and spiritual IQ is the subject of 1 Corinthians chapter 2. And so what this is telling us is that your human IQ is not a factor in learning Bible doctrine. Because when you were born again, the Bible says that God the Holy Spirit regenerated a human spirit inside of you. Titus 3, 5. And that God the Holy Spirit took up residence inside that human spirit as the spirit of truth. And his functional title under teacher is spirit of truth. And so that he is your teacher. And that when the truth of Bible doctrine enters your ear, whether you're there listening or whether you're seeing a diagram or uh, whether the deaf mute is receiving it written on their back. That's how you communi communicate to a deaf mute. However you are receiving the truth, it goes in through the human spirit. Now, the question is, are you carnal or spiritual? Because if you have your sins confessed up to date, God the Holy Spirit can function as your teacher. If you're carnal, the idea for you is to use the rebound technique before Bible class so that the spirit is not squelched and that he can function as your teacher. So you have a spiritual IQ as a born-again believer and that every one of us is equal in our ability to learn doctrine. You say, no, I'm not. Well, the truth is, as a reversionist, if you dip the egg in concrete so many times, you're going to have problems. Because Pastor Brad is he's trying to teach you, but guess what? That truth is going into your soul and it's hitting a concrete wall because of your reversionism. And do you know what that means? You have to go on a crash course of Bible doctrine to break through the hardness of heart in your own soul. Yes, you may have a hard time relearning doctrine. But the truth is, if you stick with it, you can do it. What it takes is the crash course. Let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 2. This is a great little summary here. I like the, uh, the intro to this section. It comes in verse 9. In 1 Corinthians 2, 9, it says, But as it is written, the eye has not seen, nor the ear heard, nor entered into the heart of man, the things which God has prepared. And that word prepared mean, is the word hatoi modzo. It means to make way for a king. And did you know that the super grace believer is applauded not only at Bema, but it says here that God rolls out the red carpet for those who have in their right lobe love for God. The things which God has prepared for those who love him. They've rounded the curve at gate five and six. So, the idea is, Jesus tried to teach the people while he was here on earth. He says, 
if you do so much as give a cup of cold water in my name, I assure you, you have reward in heaven. And the idea is here is that the time spent in Bible class in the bottom circle in fellowship is redeeming the time. It's purchasing the day with Bible doctrine. And it has a value that is so immense you have no idea the dividends this is going to pay when you get in heaven. In eternity future, those Bible classes, those boring Bible classes, stacked up, stacked up, stacked up, and stacked up mean that you have redeemed that day. You redeemed the next day. You purchased that day with Bible doctrine. And the value of that is it, it multiplies into eternity future with a value that you can't even comprehend. See, if you make it to the point in your spiritual life where you rounded the curve and you can love God because of all he has done for you, God has prepared a red carpet for you, rolled it out when you step into heaven, and for all of eternity, the reward that he is going to give you is going to glorify him forever. So verse 9 is the introduction. And uh, he goes on, he says, But God has revealed them to us through his Spirit. For the Spirit searches all things, yes, the deep things of God. And so that's Theonoustos right there. That is God-breathed doctrine. Verse 11. For what man knows the things of a man except the spirit of man which is in him? And so he's talking about the human spirit inside of you. Even so, no one knows the things of God except the spirit of God. Now what he's saying is, is that God the Holy Spirit is now, he see, he's right there in your human spirit. So you know the things inside of you. God the Holy Spirit is inside of you. He knows the things of God. So you have what is called as the divine transponder organ. Have you ever seen a transponder on the top of the big semi-trucks? It says, when you go by the way station, it says, trucks equipped with transponder follow directions. And that means that inside that little guard shack in the way station, that transponder on that truck is telegraphing the weight of the load of that truck over to the way station. And that if he's got a green light on inside his cab, he doesn't have to pull across the scale. He can just keep it in gear and keep that load rolling. It's transponding, see? The truck is sending a signal to the way station, and the way station sends a signal to the truck. Keep trucking, buddy. Don't even slow down. And so the human spirit with God, the Holy Spirit, on the inside is the same. You know what's on it, going on inside of you. God, the Holy Spirit, knows the things of God, and there's a transfer one way to the other. It's a divine transponder organ. Now let's move on. Verse 12. Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, that we might know the things that have been freely given to us by God. Grace all the way. You see what he, he really reiterates the idea, the freely things that are freely given to us by God. That means we can't work for it and we didn't deserve it. It was a non-meritorious gift. Verse 13. These things we also speak or communicate, not in words which man wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Spirit teaches. Now, he says words. That means that's vocabulary. We're going to learn the vocabulary storage. And what he's saying is we have a unique vocabulary 
that we're going to use to teach you spiritual concepts. And if you're going to learn Bible doctrine, you're going to have to learn some of these vocabulary terms. They're going to have to become second nature to you. Just like the acrostic of gap. You've got to, you, you've got to know. Hey, that stands for grace apparatus for perception. Comparing spiritual things with spiritual. Now that's another compartment. The frame of reference. So already you've got two compartments of the cardia. You've got vocabulary storage. And you've got frame of reference. And what he's saying is. If you're going to learn doctrine. Doctrine is built on doctrine. You've got to know. See before you understand. Um, let's see. You need to understand salvation by grace before you can learn living the Christian way of life by grace. See, there's a logical sequence here. First, you need to learn you're saved by grace. You didn't earn it or deserve it. It was a free gift of God. All you did was believe in Christ and God imputed you with his own righteousness and his eternal life and you didn't do a thing. You just received it. It was, it was grace all the way. That was salvation though. And guess what? God continues the same policy after salvation. It's grace. In phase two. Even after you're born again. The same policy. God gave you a spiritual life. You didn't earn it or deserve it. Every one of us had the same system. It's called the divine dinosphere. We have our own palace. Our own fortress. Which we reside in. And God freely gave it to us. Just like a Ferrari. As a gift. Uh. At salvation. It's yours. So the frame of reference. Doctrine is built on doctrine. Comparing spiritual things with spiritual. Okay in verse 14. He says. But the natural man does not receive the things of the spirit of God. For they are foolishness to him. Nor can he know them. Because they're spiritually discerned. And so. The natural man here is the sukikos man, the soulish man. He's, he's an unbeliever. He doesn't have the d divine transponder organ. He doesn't have the divine transponder organ. He doesn't have a human spirit. He doesn't have the Holy Spirit residing in him. And therefore, the spiritual concepts of the, of the Christian way of life, they're foolishness to him. And he's the one who'll make fun of you. But uh, guess what? We, the truth is, you've got compassion in your soul for the unbeliever. And everything you do in life is to cultivate a testimony so that one day they might believe in Christ. For you know, even the unbeliever who's making fun of you as a Christian... I can't believe you listen to what all those camel riders wrote down 2,000 years ago in the Bible. They, those are a bunch of goat herders over there. Why would you want to listen to that? And you guess what? You stay relaxed and you, and you laugh and you say, yeah, I know, but over 60% of Bible prophecy has already come true, so I'm going to keep on studying. See, you stay relaxed and you keep on cultivating that testimony for one day you you're praying your prayer is for even that unbeliever who is making a joke out of you would get born again therefore see you don't retaliate you relax and you smile and you say i know it i know i'm a fool i'm a fool for christ that's what paul would say keep on cultivating the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God. Okay, so if you're dealing with an unbeliever, you try to keep the gospel the central uh, conversation. That's what he needs. You can't talk to him about the Christian way of life. You need to you keep the focus on the gospel. So you don't talk to him about, what well, did Adam have a belly button? See? 
That's what he wants to argue with you about. But that's not where you need to go. You keep the concentration on the gospel message. Verse 15. But he who is spiritual. And so this is the pneumaticus man. This is the born again believer. But he's not only born, born again. He is residing in the bottom circle. He's operating clean from his priesthood. He's the spiritual man. The pneumaticus man. He who is spiritual discerns or judges all things. Yet he himself is rightly discerned by no one. You know what that means? God the Holy Spirit may be leading you personally to do something that makes no logical sense whatsoever. You do it anyway. And you may look crazy. And nobody else can discern what you're doing because God the Holy Spirit's the one leading you to do it. I used to show up to church two hours early to blow the leaves off the parking lot. And I got there early enough that I did it early enough where no one could see me do it. I didn't want anybody to see me do it. I got in there and I vacuumed the floors. And I wiped down door handles. And I did all of that and I made sure I got there early enough where no one could see me do it. God the Holy Spirit was leading me to do that job. And I was stepping in the gap. I didn't know what my gift was yet. And I just knew I wanted to serve God. So I did it. And it may have seemed foolish to some. But I did it because God was leading me to do it. When God led me to, led me to leave, I left. It may have seemed foolish to some. But I left. He who is spiritual judges or has discernment in all things. Yet he himself is rightly discerned by no one. And then Paul goes ahead and he says here in verse 16. For who has known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. He says, we hold the mystery doctrine. Paul knew it. He says, I have it. I have the mystery doctrine. The thinking of Jesus Christ. The Bible, the, the very word of God is the mind of Christ, Bible doctrine. And verse 3, though, you have the born again believer who can't learn. And Paul says, and I, brethren, that means they're born again, could not speak to you or communicate to you as spiritual, as a pneumaticus man. See, the pneumaticus man is in the bottom circle. He's in fellowship. He's functioning in the sphere of the spirit. He has God, the Holy Spirit, as his teacher. He's, he's clean in his priesthood. He's ready to rock. He's ready to listen. Got concentration. He couldn't speak to you as spiritual people, but as to carnal. And so here's the third man, the sarkikos man, the fleshly man. And what does he say about the carnal, the carnal man? As to babes in Christ, I fed you with milk and not with solid food. For until now, you are not able to receive it. And even now, you're still not able for you are still carnal for where, and he lists their mental attitude sins, for where there is envy, see socialism, strife, divisions among you, are you not carnal and behaving like unbelievers? So you can be born again and in carnality and anybody on the street can't tell if you're a Christian or not. As a matter of fact, you can... You look just like an unbeliever. Full of mental attitude sins. And so, the believer out of fellowship, he's out here in the carnal blob. The only doctrine that he can really assimilate is the milk. And Paul says, I'm feeding you milk because you're still carnal. You hadn't rebounded yet. You hadn't got back in fellowship. And... Uh, 
You're over here and you're lamed in your spiritual life because of it. So what's the issue for the carnal believer? Confession of sins. 1 John 1, 9. And the, and uh, see the only real doctrine, the only real application that the carnal believer needs to make is first of all, 1 John 1, 9. And so what did I tell you? God saved us in grace and he continues the same policy after salvation. What did we do to earn or deserve rebound the technique? What did we do to earn or deserve rejoining fellowship? What did we do to earn or deserve sitting around the tables of, table of God's word? Nothing. And the rebound technique is non-meritorious. Anybody, any born again Christian can confess their sins to God the Father in Jesus' name and receive forgiveness and cleansing. So the carnal believer, the issue is rebound. And then when he rejoins fellowship, God the Holy Spirit can once again function under the idea of his teacher. Uh, the question is, how bad can a believer sin? Well, these sins they list here, these are terrible. People are dividing the church. They're, they're, they're full of envy. They, they're causing strife and divisions. See, the, the question is, how bad a sin can a Christian commit? And he can, I'll tell you, he can commit worse than bad. Worse than the unbeliever. And if you read the rest of this letter, you'll find out that a born again Christian was having an adulterous relationship with his stepmother inside the local church at Corinth. That's how bad it was. And Paul had a lot of heads to chop off when he came to town with this letter. Well, I used up more than uh, my allotment of time right there. If you have any questions, you can put those in the chat mode. We covered a lot of ground, but hopefully I was clear enough to get the, get the point across. Guess what? We're going to continue on this same idea on Sunday. It's going to be a different nail to hit, but it's the same idea. Okay. I'm about to switch over to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. There's only two rituals in the church age. One is water baptism. You do it one time. It represents the top circle union with Christ. The other ritual is the Lord's table. You do it many times. It represents rejoining fellowship or the bottom circle. You do it many times. The question is, who can take the Lord's table? And that's any believer. Any believer who understands rebound. Well, there's a warning that comes with the Lord's table. I'm going to read it to you. First Corinthians eleven twenty seven. it says, Therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks the, this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. Verse 28, he says, But let a man examine himself. See, that's the self-examination where you examine your life in the light of God's word. And if you find anything out of place as far as personal sin, you can get, confess that to God the Father in Jesus' name. And you receive forgiveness and cleansing. That's the self-examination. Let a man examine himself. Then let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner. That means with unconfessed sin in the life. 
eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this reason, many are weak. That's stage one, discipline. And sick. That's stage two, discipline, intensified misery. And many sleep. That's stage three, discipline, the sin unto death. For if we would judge ourselves, that means the self-examination, we would not be judged. That means we would not receive divine discipline. But when we are judged, that means when we receive discipline, we are chastened by the Lord that we may not be condemned with the world. That means the world is under judgment. And when we're in carnality, we're taking part in that judgment. And God, is, he wants to separate us from that judgment. So here's a good point. And I thought of this this week. Oh, you're having such a hard time. Why don't you put the shovel down? Why don't you make application of this verse? Why are you resisting the plan of God for your life? Why don't you confess your sins, get back in the fellowship, and get some Bible classes under your belt? Oh, you keep on having such bad luck, I wonder why. We are chastened by the Lord that we might not be condemned with the world. He's urging you to get back in fellowship, but you won't listen. You're like a ham-headed mule. You're stubborn. You're hard-headed. How much more scourging will you have to go through before you listen to the Lord and return to Bible class? He's saying here, but when we are judged, when we receive discipline, oh, you're having such a hard time. Better listen to Pastor Brad. Put the shovel down. Get clean in your priesthood and get back to Bible class. We are chastened by the Lord that we might not be condemned with the world. Therefore, my brethren, when you come together, eat, wait for one another. And so he's, he's giving us some encouragement here. Be in fellowship when we take the Lord's table so that we don't receive discipline. And he, God had even killed some of these people here in the church at Corinth. Because they refuse to do a self-examination. See the idea is if you see some personal. If you examine yourself and say. Lord I lied. I confess. I confess God. I lied in this situation. In Jesus name. Amen. Lord I cheated. I got angry. I was full of wrath, malice, violence within. See, I confess it. In 1 John 1, 9, it says to confess as in a courtroom scene. Homologeo, to name, sight, or identify. And the courtroom scene is the cross where Jesus Christ was judged for that sin. We confess it. Okay, I normally review a lot of the doctrine concerning uh, the two elements, but I ran out of time. And uh, if you want to uh, take a review of that, I think you can catch one of the old lessons on the first Wednesday of the month. We're going to have to go ahead and take the Lord's table this evening. I'm going to read from 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 23. It says, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you that the Lord Jesus on the same night in which he was betrayed took bread when he had given thanks he broke it and said take eat this is my body which is broken for you do this in remembrance of me you may take the bread in the same manner he also took the cup after supper saying this cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it 
in remembrance of me. Take the cup. I'm going to pray with you, but don't run off. Our Father God in heaven, we thank you for this ritual where we can remember the person and work of your son, Jesus Christ. Father, we thank you for the Apostle Paul and young Timothy. We thank you for our spiritual IQs where we can, in fact, learn all doctrine of the mystery and uh, apply it to our own lives. We thank you and praise you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, I apologize for running over. I tell you I'm going to teach for an hour, and I teach, uh, spoke for an hour and two minutes, but um, I'll try to make it up to you next time.